Great. Oh, great. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you all to uh, Wednesday, March 17th, 2021, MAPC Executive Committee meeting. Um, I am President Erin Wortman, and I want to welcome you all here. Happy St. Patrick's Day. And for those in Suffolk County, happy Evacuation Day. Um, we are um, going to start off uh, by taking the roll. Um, so if everyone could just unmute and we'll try and do this as quickly as possible. Uh, Sharonda Almeida, John Barrows, Keith Bergman. Present. Karen Canfield. Adam Chapdelaine. Present. Bob Cohen. Here. Mayor Curditone. Tom Daniel. John DePriest. Yeah. Yolanda Greaves. Sandra Hackman. Here. Mo Handel. Here. Jared Johnson. Tabor Keeley. Here. Steve Olinoff. Here. Caitlin Passafaro. George Proakis. Courtney Rainey. Absent. Uh, Jenny Rate. Present. Bandana Rao. Present. Sam Seidel. Here. Steve Silvera. Present. Lauren Shirtliff. Mayor Spicer. Juan Vega. Elaine Vanya. Here. And me, Erin Wortman. Present. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Next up on the agenda is the approval of minutes from December 16th, 2020 as amended, and the February 24th, 2021 minutes. So moved. Second. Okay, motion made by Bob uh, Cohen, second made by John DePriest. Roll calls required. Let me get my roll call group up. All right, here we go. I'm only doing first names this time. Sharonda, John, Keith. Aye. Karen. Adam. Aye. Bob. Thumbs up. <laughs> Mayor Curditone. Tom Daniel. John DePriest. Aye. Yolanda. Sandra. Yes. Mo. Jared. That was a yes, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, Tabor. Yes. Steve Olinoff. <sighs> Caitlin, George Proakis, Courtney, Jenny. Yes. Vandana. Yes. Sam. Yes. Steve. Abstain. Okay. Lauren, Mayor Spicer, Juan, Elaine. Yep. Aaron, aye. Motion passes with one abstention. Thank you so much, everyone. Next up is the report of the treasurer, Sam. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. A little bit of sunshine, good, good days. We hope ahead. Um, we are this month looking at the January 2021 income statement and the overall uh, picture is good. Um, here are just some things to note that we in our last uh, get together, approved the mid-year uh, budget uh, update. And so those new numbers that we approved last time are now incorporated into the income statement. So you'll, you'll notice that if you've been looking um, at, it, at it at that level. Um, the other uh, important thing to note is that our administrative expenses and our uh, direct labor expenses uh, held steady. They're at 94% of what we budgeted but they're both at 94, which means that our overhead rate is holding steady at 123%, which is good. Um, and then the other thing to note is that our revenue, uh, our revenue projections are now much more in line with the, the actual numbers that we're gonna see, but you'll notice that in this month, it was down at 67%. That's because we don't count the money until we actually do the work. And that depends on the cycle of the work project as they go along. So there's 
there's nothing there uh, to note other than that that number is down uh, this month. And then our cumulative overhead rate is at 122%. So that's one below uh, what our approved rate is. That's good. I, I, my sense from Sheila, who's away on vacation this week, is that um, you know, we, we'll be watching those numbers uh, pretty closely through the end of the year, uh, given everything that was uh, involved with COVID, time off, et cetera. Um, that concludes uh, the treasurer's report for this month. Uh, any questions, comments, thoughts? Do you, you want a motion? Yes, I would entertain a motion to- So moved. To, Second. Uh, Robert uh, gave it, was that Jenny, I think? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, with a second. And Aaron, I'll hand it back to you for- Sure. Uh, so that was a Bob Cohen motion and a Jenny uh, second, Heidi. Here we go. Uh, Sharonda, John Barrows, Keith? Aye. Karen? Adam? Aye. Bob? Yes. Mer uh, Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Sandra? Mo? Yes. Jared? Tabor? Yes. Steve? Aye, and I want to say aye to the last uh, motion because I was having technical problems. Thank you. Totally understand. Um, Caitlin? George? Courtney? Jenny? Yes. Vandana? Yes. Sam? Yes. Steve? Yes. Lauren? Mayor Spicer? Juan? Elaine? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much, everyone. Next up uh, on the agenda is the report of the executive director, Mark. Yes, good morning, everyone. So we're, we're gonna divide this into two parts as, as I often do. I'm gonna talk about some things that do not relate to COVID and Rebecca is going to talk a little bit about some of our work on the COVID response and recovery field generally. Uh, there is not a written executive director's report this month. We had one last month and Heidi has already prompted the staff to start working on next month. So we will have one then. I'm just gonna cover a few highlights. Uh, this morning I woke up and, and turned the screen on and had 33 contracts to sign. And Rebecca's smiling because she has to sign them before I sign them. So we all go through this. Uh, and they were very heavily are related to two things that I'm quite proud of. One is the great work of the transportation department in alliance with mass development, getting out the latest round of our taxi and livery program funding, which uh, tries to repurpose uh, the taxi industry uh, to do some work for municipalities, for regional transit authorities, and for others to provide first mile, last mile services across a wide variety of activities. You'll recall this program, was initially focused specifically on COVID response. It is now still focused on COVID response, but also focused on other mobility needs. And it is transporting people to get vaccines is one of the things that's happening. Uh, we won't know for a while whether that's a significant or a boutique use of the program, but it is, it is available. And we have a sense that people will be using it for that purpose. Um, another thing that, that showed up in the contracts today was uh, the preparation for a session on immigrant entrepreneurs that will be taking place this evening. Uh, we had uh, the showing of the first uh, video uh, presentation from that program, which focused on Asian immigrant entrepreneurs in the city of Quincy. Uh, but it's really part of a larger effort uh, to focus attention on uh, immigrant entrepreneurs throughout the region, to recognize the contribution that they make, to encourage people to utilize those businesses, Sadly, also in the case of particularly Asian immigrants, encourage a rethinking of some of the terrible uh, perspectives that were inculcated uh, certainly by the previous administration and that have occurred during the COVID pandemic in terms of ongoing attacks on uh, people of Asian and Pacific Islander descent here in the United States. Uh, the video is great. Uh, I thought the focus on Quincy and the issues going on in that community and the ways in which it's handled some of the issues of the pandemic were very, very helpful to see and, um, and also raise some, some critical questions which are important to all of us. 
Uh, so I want to thank the uh, staff in arts and culture, economic development, particularly for being involved in that. There's been a tremendous amount going on on the climate front, almost more than I can even believe. And, and we have many departments really under Rebecca's leadership, of clean energy, data services, government affairs, and I'm probably missing a few that have been actively engaged in some of this climate work. As you know, the climate bill passed the Senate the other day. I think we're not quite through the House yet. Is that right? Not yet, but we're hoping to get through soon. And uh, hopefully the governor will sign it. But, you know, whether there's a back and forth and there may be, um, my expectation is that we are now quite close to having a passed climate bill with a lot of great uh, reforms and updates and goals and tools that will be part of that. Uh, at the same time that that's been going on, requiring an enormous amount of attention by staff, uh, we've also been responding to the, um, the CECP uh, guidelines that came out of EOEA. Um, and, you know, volume is not necessarily a measurement of quantity, of quality, but I, I have to say that the document that Rebecca and I received to review the other day of comments on the CECP is 18 pages long. The type is not large and, um, and it covers a very, very wide array of issues. Uh, everything from you know, many of the, the building envelope issues that were a, a key issue in the climate bill to issues of smart growth, land use, VMT reduction, TOD, and a few areas where we feel the, uh, this excellent document, we're overall very pleased with the plan, uh, where we felt it could be a little more aggressive and a little more informative. And we have really strived to not only include our recommendations as recommendations, but to do a tremendous amount of technical backup to support those recommendations. So I'm, I'm very proud of that work. Is there any negotiation? Someone else needs to mute. There we go. Okay. Tabor's probably selling a building even as we speak. Anyway, um, so uh, that, is, that is an area where there's been tremendous work and that I'm really quite proud of. At the same time, uh, Martin Pillsbury and our, I think our newest staff member, Van Du, uh, who is uh, the new staff person in environment, have been working on a comment letter to the MEPA folks regarding additional guidelines and, and provisions that they are, have put forward on the MEPA program. Uh, this doesn't happen all that often. It's a unique opportunity for us to work with our colleagues at MEPA on this really important program, and uh, particularly to step up the focus on climate issues in the review of individual projects. As you all know, we do letters very frequently on MEPA projects. We're heavily focused on making that program more effective and more responsive. And so the opportunity to comment uh, on and influence uh, these recommendations, I think is, is extremely important to all of us. Uh, I will close, I can't cover everything, but I will close just with a comment about MetroCom. We don't have a, a MetroCom update today, but the staff is really um, burning the midnight oil, so to speak, to make sure that we meet our June deadline in completing this decadal regional plan. And I think we're going to make it. Uh, and uh, our goal is to get it done by the 30th of June to do rollout activities starting in July and probably to actually have um, board and council, probably the board vote in July and a council meeting immediately after Labor Day. I don't know if that's going to be virtual or if it's going to be in person. We'll, we'll see. I have a feeling it will still be virtual. But uh, in any event, uh, we hope that by that time we'll have the, the plan adopted. Um, just yesterday, there was a, a presentation to a couple of the subregions, I think to trick actually alone. Uh, and we have a series of research releases, meetings with local officials, and focused discussions about policy with various constituent groups that are all going on during the months of March and April, um, followed by what Emily refers to as Metro Common May, which is a very high ramp up of final activities during the month of May, which I hope you will all have an opportunity to be involved in. Uh, as I said in a letter that Aaron and I are are signing to council members this morning, uh, it's been quite a time to write a regional plan. And it has been hard to get people to focus on long-term planning when you know, you're in the midst of a pandemic, a recession, and a racial reckoning in our society. Uh, but in some ways, there's no better time 
to try and plan for you know, our own future, our kids' future, and the future of our communities. And Eric and Emily and their team have really done a great job of making sure that that process did not skip a beat, that it kept going forward, that it adapted to the new demands, and we're going to have a great product as a result. I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Mark. Um, I thought, you know, to do the update, I'll focus a little bit on the work that we're doing right now around kind of vaccination and then maybe end on a more hopeful note to talk about some of the work that we're doing around recovery. Um, so we continue to play a role, both coordinating communities and being a liaison with the administration as we work through these very thorny vaccination issues. Uh, Mark Fine on our team is serving as our representative on a weekly call with Secretary Sutters and the Lieutenant Governor and other local officials to really try to figure out, you know, how to better communicate and how to most effectively, uh, you know, get shots into arms. I would say it has been a it has been a very bumpy bumpy process, and there has been a lot of, you know, I think conflict, and I'm I'm sure you've seen it play out in the globe around what the appropriate role of local boards of health and all of the planning that they have put into, you know, whether that's, you know, we're utilizing that to the best effect or not, and we probably aren't. On a more hopeful note, uh, we have been really working with some of our communities to think about how to stand up regional collaboratives, uh, which seems to be the way the administration wants to go uh, to set up vaccine, vaccine distribution. And I'm really happy to report an initiative that Mark Fine and Barry Keppard were working on with eight communities uh, north of Boston, including Cambridge, Somerville, Everett, Malden, Revere, Chelsea, Arlington, Medford, uh, which we just got letter that was approved. That will be a partnership with the Cambridge Health Alliance, Tufts University, and those eight communities. And uh, I think we're you know really proud of that work. That's a group of communities that and public health departments that pre-pandemic didn't have a history of working together. Uh, Barry has been convening those public health directors weekly for the last year. And I think that hard work of, you know, really fostering communication and, and building relationships has resulted in them being able to kind of quickly turn on a dime, you know, find these great community partners in Tufts University and the Cambridge Health Alliance. And we're looking at a hub and smoke model there where we will first stand up to larger sites, but then really be able to do pop-up and smaller community-based clinics, hopefully in the future. So, you know, incredibly proud of the work the team did there. Everyone from, you know, data services coming up with, you know, really good arguments around transit dependency and access to sites based on transit, not just utilizing drive times um, to, you know, the work of the public health and the municipal collaboration teams. And hopefully we will in April uh, actually be able to see those sites on the ground. We've also been working very closely with the um, North Suffolk Public Health District, which is Chelsea, Revere, and Winthrop, and helping them stand up vaccination sites as well. On kind of a more on the recovery side, uh, we continue to really both do our research work, and I know all of you got to see the fabulous presentations by staff at our council meeting, thinking about the future of work and what the future might look like but also our recovery work. And we were just recorded, uh, rewarded a number of very exciting uh, local recovery grants. We particularly were focusing on uh, some of our gateway cities in those grants, and we're excited to get those up and off the ground and work with those communities on their recovery programs. Additionally, we continue our work um, and really trying to look at the digital divide and how we can help communities with the digital divide planning and doing digital planning. and are in talks, I think we'll launch next week, a partnership with the MBI, the Mass Broadband Institute to work with four of our communities to really expand uh, internet access in our gateway cities. So just a flavor of some of the many projects that continue to happen uh, really around COVID response and COVID recovery at the agency. We can, we can answer questions by the one of us if you have any. I think Sandra has a question. Go ahead, Sandra. Thanks. So um, these regional uh, collaborations on, on the vaccine, it's sort of an obvious question of why this wasn't the approach from the beginning, but is this as a re direct result of MAPC's advocacy for this kind of model? I mean, it seems as though it could have been done six months ago. It's really good it's happening now, but um, 
just wondered why why it's taken so long to get to this point, but I guess maybe the answer is I, I don't know. But well, I guess I would add I, I, there were a number of regional collaboratives and plans for commu how communities would work together that have been ongoing for years. And at, in the beginning, you know, a not, almost all of our communities really stood up and said, we're going to figure out how to work with our neighbors to vaccinate our first responders and police, and then, you know, build on that model. So there were a lot of communities and a lot of matchmaking that went into that first round. But the state then came back and decided that in order for vaccines to be distributed to a regional model, they had to stand up and be able to do 750 vaccinations a day. And that was you know, well above the threshold of many of these smaller regional collaboratives that had, had really, all of them had stood up to get to first responders. And so because of that directive, they also, also had to be able to utilize 85% of the vaccines that you got on a weekly basis in order to continue to get vaccine. So because those parameters changed, we then had to go back and rethink with groups of communities, is there the capacity in a way to kind of figure out larger regional groupings, you know, partnerships, this partnership with CHA is gonna be a really important partnership. So they really have the capacity to deliver that level of shots. And so that's why there, there was this switch that happened so quickly. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of the way that the community is really stood together and worked together and, and you know, worked through all these kind of, we're still working through, but all these operational challenges to, to come together and come up with a regional model that's actually gonna work and, and you know, provide vaccines. Great, any other questions? Not seeing any, but thank you so much, Mark and Rebecca, uh, for your reports and all your detail. And obviously thank you staff uh, for all their great work, uh, particularly over the last month. So thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda is uh, the report of the legislative committee. I'm gonna call on legislative chair Keith uh, for an update. Well, th uh, thanks so much. Uh, we have uh, a lot uh, to uh, go over in uh, this month's legislative uh, report. Uh, we'll have a legislative update and then specifically uh, talk about the Universal uh, School uh, Meals Act, uh, Commission on uh, uh, Inquiry of the uh, Commonwealth Response to uh, uh, COVID. Uh, and propose funding options for an equitable recovery. And the uh, legislative uh, committee has been meeting on a monthly basis. You've got recommendations on, uh, on, uh, uh, on each of these. And I will uh, defer to Lizzie, who I now see on my screen. So thanks. Uh, thanks again to the, our great uh, uh, staff who uh, helps our legislative committee uh, in these very uh, busy times. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I think just to, by way of a quick update before we get into these pieces, the legislature um, is back and doing a lot of work. Um, they actually are moving faster at the start of this legislative session than I've seen pretty much ever in my time doing this work. Um, they, in fact, just this week, the Senate passed a climate bill. They, um, if you go over to the House, it's the bill that they passed last time that the governor vetoed. We're kind of moving that along. Um, they have also passed uh, legislation that would extend kind of the way we've been voting. Um, it's not an entirely long-term fix, but it's for sort of the, the duration of the time that we're in. And I think that work's gonna continue. Um, and then both branches are taking up language relating to unemployment insurance and sort of a um, kind of first state level step on COVID uh, recovery. So there's a lot going on inside the state house now. We're still meeting only remotely with legislators, but we're starting to have a lot more of those conversations. I think it's also safe to say that a lot of folks inside the building are really interested in MAPC's um, thoughts on recovery. So that was, you know, part of the reason why we're we're hoping to take the vote today on these recovery funding priorities. Um, so I'm going to stop there on the update piece and actually move right into these items that are up uh, for discussion or vote today. Um, and the first one that we're going to take up is the Universal School Meals Bill. 
I'm actually going to have Diego discuss the bill. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Heidi Secker and our public health team who really helped to advance this priority for us. And just by way of background, MAPC has been working on food policy issues for a number of years now. It's really been a, a central focus of the work of the team. And just last year, we actually were helpful in passing the breakfast after the bell legislation. Um, and so that was a kind of a, a good success. And this legislation um, builds essentially on the work that we did around breakfast after the bell and food, general food security priorities of the agency. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Diego and have him describe what the bill is and what it does. Sure, thanks Lizzie. Um, so ju just like another um, key stat to kind of keep in mind as we discuss this bill is before COVID the stat for um, the number of kids that are food insecure was one in nine. Um, since COVID that's jumped up to one in five. Um, so that's obviously like really startling. Um, and it's, you know, unfortunate that within the one to five, you know, one out of five kids that's food insecure, um, black and Latino um, kids are disproportionately impacted by that food insecurity. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so the way right now food, um, school meals kind of work are the basically three tiers, um, fully paid meals, reduced um, reduce meals and then free, free school meals. Um, so the majority of schools um, participate in two basic federal programs called Provision, Provision 2 and um, CEP, which is Community Eligibility Program. And both of them are basically use certain thresholds to determine how much the federal government will reimburse schools for. Um, so for example, you know, kids with um, a high population of low income students like Boston, Western Springfield, um, they have a higher threshold of, of, you know, that are eligible for this program. So like those schools in, in particular actually already provide universal school meals. Um, there are though like other schools that, um, other school districts that have, um, you know, don't quite meet that threshold. And so they're reimbursed a certain portion of it. And the way it works currently is um, schools have to kind of make up the difference if they want to um, provide kids with, with meals. Um, so what the bill would do is it would um, mandate that um, all school districts provide free breakfast and lunch to all students re um, regardless. Um, and basically um, through DTA and DESE require that schools create like a strategy to kind of maximize eligibility um, to or maximize the amount of federal funds they'd be able to get. And by doing so, like reaching out to families to see if they're eligible for SNAP in particular, um, but then also kind of making it more expansive so that more services are included um, for, for the kids. Um, you know, so in the memo, there is, um, a, it's just an estimate that the bill would cost um, between 104, $120 million annually. Um, you know, what that's obviously a hang up that we've heard from certain people or certain, um, you know, groups, I should say. Um, so the, the two, you know, education and healthcare are the two biggest um, costs to the state government. And, you know, I, I think the coalition um, believes that this bill will help improve outcomes for both education and healthcare um, for students. And, and in doing so, will help kind of reduce some of the costs in general that it has on, on the state. Um, so I'll kind of pause there to see if anybody has any questions. Just, just another quick, um, um, like, I guess, figure to throw out is, so there's 2,100 school, schools in Massachusetts, um, 685 of them already provide universal school meals. And so, again, the, the bill is really um, trying to just maximize the amount of federal dollars that we get to provide school meals for kids. So I'll pause there. I know I blazed through a lot, but Heidi, obviously, feel free to jump in if I've missed anything. I think you provided a great overview. Yeah, thank you, Diego. We're happy to take questions or comments. I see Buzz's uh, thumbs up, uh, and I uh, agree. I think that you know food insecurity is a huge issue. We require that students like kids go to school. Uh, and I feel like food should be part of that. Um, I don't know. I, go I ahead. See Mayor Spicer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor. Yes, I. 
I thank you, Diego, for that report. Um, you know, one, one of the things I wanted to point out here in Framingham, we, you know, we have uh, instituted over the last couple of years a policy that no child goes hungry. You know, and if they uh, you know can't afford to pay it for lunch, it, you know, it is provided for them. But really, trying to look at say other communities besides the, uh, the the three big ones, are there other communities doing similar kinds of things already, and that it, it can uh, look at some data because I you know I, I think also. Uh, looking at school being remote learning and, and hybrid learning, where do you fill in the gaps with meals and so forth? So what we've been doing is you can come and, and have a grab and go meal at every one of our elementary schools. And we've kind of opened it up for everyone in the community, um, given the fact that we've been on hybrid learning. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, it, it, it is clear uh, to me that there has been an uptick in the number of people that are food insecure um, across the board and, uh, you know, and really trying to say, you know, as a former classroom teacher and administrator, children can't learn if they're hungry. And uh, so th those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, some of these basic needs need to be addressed and, uh, you know, uh, uh, collectively and cohesively. So thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you, Mayor. Great. And, and I, I will just, just quickly add about, um, or, so you mentioned something about um, kind of what other communities are doing. I think Quincy is an example of, you know, how complex I guess this could be. So for example, the school district of Quincy doesn't necessarily provide universal school meals, but certain schools do because that particular school has high, um, a high number of low income students. Um, and so, you know, this bill would make it easier for Quincy to adopt that um, throughout the school district and obviously, you know, other communities as well. Caber. Thank you. Um, just questioning the uh, publicity, and I don't know if there's if this becomes lobbying, but town meeting season is here, and um, you know a lot of budgets are going up, and a lot of many incomes have not. So there, it's going to be a rough road to uh, be garnering more uh, for the schools, and I'm just questioning whether or not there's anything we can do as a publicity uh, piece for the public at, at large in general, because uh, a lot of people are going to be questioning, just as Diego says about the uh, certain schools have uh, privileges, others don't. And, you know, all decisions are made over Facebook. So it's just a matter of making sure that the message is accurate. Is there any uh, any budget or is there any uh, uh, thought on, on doing any kind of PR for this and, and outreach? Yeah, I mean, so so Project Bread has been the, the group that's been leading this coalition. Um, and obviously, because we haven't yet taken a formal position on it, have been a little, not have little, have been limited in what we can um, say about it. But um, yeah, that, that's certainly something I'm happy to bring back to the group um, and happy to connect you offline if you have like specific suggestions um, or like instances you, you have in mind that, that you'd want to address. Um, but yeah, I mean, the session just start, started, well, just like three, three months ago, um, but definitely that's one of the things that um, there, you know, Heidi and I have been participating on the on those calls and definitely the publicity media push is something we're going to, they are already working on. I don't have any specifics, but I just wanted to make sure we had some kind of control on, on the message because as uh, you know, we all know once these things get to a town meeting set up and, and somebody has the wrong message and they have the microphone, you know, everything's out of control, so. That's all. I think probably a Tabor that our ability, uh, we have ability to influence the messaging of the larger campaign, but it isn't our decision. Where I do think we can make a specific contribution is on educating cities and towns and their staff so they understand the budget implications, they understand the policy implications, they understand what's available from the federal government and how to access that. And I, I think that we probably will concentrate in that regard and you know, try and, and forestall some of the misinformation that, that sometimes makes itself available in the midst of a municipal process. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I believe, not seeing anyone else, I believe there is um, from the memo, hold on, let me pull it up, um, that um, there's a request from the legislative committee on this item and the request is or the recommendation is that the executive committee uh, recommends that the legislative committee uh, endorses um, the bill 
So I don't know if that is the will of anyone. I would make that motion. I'll second. Oh, everyone's so excited. So motion made by Mo, second made by uh, John DePriest. Any just for clarity, for clarity, Aaron, if I may, it's the, the motion is that the legislative committee recommends that the executive committee endorse. Oh, sorry. Not the other way around. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I really sorry about that. that. No, I appreciate I still second it. Great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, just read that kind of weird on my end. So uh, yeah. Um, so if there are no other questions or clarifications, uh, we are going to do roll call vote as required. Here we go. Sharonda? Hi. Okay. Uh, John Barrows? Keith? Hi. Karen? Adam? Hi. Bob? Uh, Mayor Curditone, uh, Tom Daniel, John DePriest, aye, Yolanda, Sandra, aye, Mo, aye, Jared, Tabor, aye, Steve, aye, Caitlin, George, Courtney, Jenny, aye, Bandana. I'll need to abstain. Okay. Sam? Yes. Steve? Lauren? Mayor Spicer? Aye. Juan? Elaine? Abstain. Aaron votes in favor. Aye. So a uh, motion passes with two abstentions, Bandana and uh, Elaine. Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, and Keith or Lizzie, who wants to go next on the next item? We'll take uh, Lizzie, please. <laughs> Feel like a Jeopardy. It looks like a Jeopardy. Um, great, thank you, and thanks everyone for um, for that vote of support. Um, so I think the next item is the um, equitable recovery, the funding document. No, I'm getting a no from Aaron. No, the next item, actually, that's right. It was the order of the agenda is um, actually, Mark, you probably want to talk about this. It's letting folks know about the COVID Recovery Commission piece. Yes, I'll, I'll do so very briefly because no action is required in this case. Um, I just wanted to inform the executive committee that the officers actually think we held a special meeting on this in February uh, for purposes of using the emergency provisions for the officers to endorse the piece of legislation filed by Senator Lesser and Representative Santiago regarding the establishment of a pandemic study commission to look into the preparedness of the Commonwealth for the pandemic and to make recommendations about future means of, uh, of greater preparedness in the future. We were actually working on such a bill at MAPC on the staff level and then learned that Senator Lesser and Representative Santiago were filing it. We reviewed the bill, we went to officers, Keith was present as the chair of the legislative committee at that meeting, and the officers voted to endorse that piece of legislation, which we did. And we are just duly reporting that to you now. And I think that's it. <laughs> we are um, working on meeting with the um, sponsors of the bill to sort of talk about some of the ways that we, um, some of the ideas that we have to make it even stronger. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, are there so, any, oh, hold on, Lizzie. Just, I just wanna make sure if there are any questions on oh. that. Um, not seeing any, great. Go ahead, Lizzie. Thanks, I'm so eager. Um, so the next document is this uh, memo around funding for um, an equitable recovery. And if you'll remember at our last executive committee meeting, we took up a list of recovery priority ideas. And we cautioned for you that a lot of those involved increased funding and that, that we would be bringing you this month um, sort of a, a list of funding ideas that we would urge the legislature to consider. Um, a couple of notes before we actually kind of get into the meat of the memo that I think is just important to bear in mind as you look at this. We definitely would, would not encourage the legislature to take up all of these items at once. Um, even for me, that would be a lot. 
But we do think that it is really important that as we think about money that's coming in from the federal government um, around relief and recovery, that those dollars end up kind of plugging usually a specific hole and are, are relatively short-term dollars, one to two years. Um, and in fact, you know, the ARPA language, actually the money comes in two tranches over the course of two years. But, you know, a lot of the gaps that we've seen in our funding priorities across the Commonwealth are things that actually need a longer term solution. And where the federal dollars will absolutely be helpful in meeting those some of those needs short term, we have long prioritized making sure that we have long term reliable sources of funding for so many of our priorities. So that is, you know, a lot of the reason why we felt like it was important to bring this to you. And then the last thing that I want to say about this is that, you know, as the legislature starts to consider possible revenue raising mechanisms, one of the things that we would also look at very closely is the impact that those revenue raising mechanisms have on the people from whom revenue is being raised. So in particular, you know, in essentially like complete alignment with the agency's equity priorities, we would want to make sure that all of the funding or revenue raising mechanisms do not disproportionately fall on people who are already financially overburdened. And so while we bring you this list as sort of a list of options that we would urge the legislature to consider, we ourselves would kind of make sure that we're looking to see the impact of those revenue raising mechanisms as they're actually being brought up. So, with all of that background, I think probably the easiest thing to do again is to share my screen and actually just kind of walk through these pieces. Um, I think I have ability to do that. Um, let me see if it works. Oh, I do, let's see. Hopefully, yeah, it looks like I've given you the right thing and not my grocery list, which would be embarrassing. Um, great. So. <laughs> I'm just gonna walk through these items and then we'll have an opportunity to talk through your questions. Um, essentially, we'll, we'll take them all at once. So we broke the document into- uh, Lizzie, I don't know if uh, the, the screen is black. We're not seeing oh, anything. Really? Interesting. It's, it's in screen sharing mode, but there's no documents. Huh. I don't know I'm if Sasha sure can help with that. Let me see. I can try to stop sharing for a second and then see if I can try again. Because sometimes yeah, it just let's see. I would try restarting it. Okay. Let me see. If not, you you have it. Let's see. Sharing or not? Still not working. Hmm. Still um, not I, I have it. I have it open, Lizzie. I can give it a try. If that's that, that would be works. great, Diego. If you if you can um yeah, because otherwise I think I need to sign out and sign back in. There it is. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Diego. I appreciate it. All right, I'm going to have you scroll up. So we broke the document. And Diego, if you can scroll down a little bit so that the statewide taxes piece is kind of at the top. So we broke the document into um, two uh, tranches of tax dollars. So the first is revenue raising mechanisms that would raise statewide taxes. Um, and then the second is local taxes. Uh, and by and large, MEPC has already taken a position in support of raising some of those local options, revenue raisers. So on the statewide taxes bucket, um, the first recommendation would be around increasing the income tax. And I can you know, let folks know this was, we had a lot of internal discussion about what this would look like, um, not least because there has been um, mechanisms in recent years to actually reduce the income tax. But we would um, support an increase, a 1% increase on the income tax, um, but making sure that it was coupled with mechanisms to protect low income individuals, um, particularly around the earned income tax credit and the dependent care tax credit. We would suggest that the 1% increase lasts for a total of five years. Um, and during that five year time frame, that we're actually looking at ways to create a graduated income tax structure for the Commonwealth. The next taxation mechanism is a tax on corporate profits. Um, we um, 
presently ap apply an 8% tax on most corporate profits, but we would seek to increase that to, to generate um, pretty significant dollars every year. This actually would return us to pre-2009 tax levels. Um, during the recession, a lot of these um, businesses received a special tax break, and we would um, encourage the legislature not to do that during this particular recession, um, as so many of those, of the, particularly the largest corporations, actually uh, raised revenue during COVID-19 and saw an increase in revenue. The next tax is a tax on unearned income. This would not affect most of us. This is really about a tax that um, affects the very highest income earners in the Commonwealth. Um, although at the same time, we would want to again, create an exemption for low and moderate income seniors um, and disabled persons, particularly if those individuals um, who are essentially relying on those sales um, should not have to, you know, for care um, or end, you know, senior retirement planning, we wouldn't want to hit people too hard there. Um, the next tax is the, the motor vehicle tax. Um, again, this is one that MAPC has long taken a position on in support of raising the gas tax. I think the biggest difference to this one is that um, we have been hearing a lot from advocates and having a lot of conversations ourselves about creating some kind of deduction for low income residents or again, a carve out. Um, and then again, making sure that we couple that with increased investments in transit. The next tax, Diego, if you could just scroll down a little bit more, thanks, is the per mileage usage fee. This is uh, commonly called a VMT fee. And again, MAPC has um, been in support of moving this as a statewide taxation mechanism for a long time. Um, I have heard anecdotally that on the federal level when they move an infrastructure bill, they might again allow um, language for states to create pilots around VMT. So we'll, that might actually be a place where we could look at this year. The next taxation mechanism would be an increase in the registry of motor vehicle fees. And again, MAPC took a position in support of raising RMV fees two years ago when we took our transportation funding priorities. So this is not a new one for the agency. Um, the HERO uh, bill would um, double the current real estate excise tax. Folks remember this is a major priority for the agency for this legislative session. Um, the, the doubled real estate tax um, excise tax would raise revenue for climate and for housing. Um, and we, we pretty actively involved in this campaign effort this year. Um, and then again, the sugary beverage tax is another one that MAPC has been in support of for a number of years now. It would uh, essentially create a tiered excise tax for sugary drinks. The, the goal of this taxation mechanism is that it's actually a declining revenue source because it's also intended to create better public health outcomes. Um, and then the last one in this statewide category is a tax on opioid manufacturers. Um, and this would levy a tax on receipts of manufacturers of opioids. The governor has actually included this proposal in two budget proposals, but the legislature has never actually included it in their final budget. Um, so then the next tranche of taxes that we would, or revenue raisers that we would suggest, because not all of these are taxes, are really around local and regional options. The first one will not be surprising. I refer to it often as my middle child, the regional ballot initiatives bill, which would allow cities and towns to raise local taxes to invest in transportation projects. Um, the next one, actually the next Four, we're all in, again, our transportation revenue um, funding proposal from last session. So that's the local parking taxes, which would be allowing cities and towns to levy local taxes on um, private parking facilities. And again, use that for infrastructure, local infrastructure improvements. Value capture tools, MAPC has actually supported value capture tools for years now. There's the traditional value capture tool that Chairman Strauss has um, supported and the, an update to the local infrastructure development program as a value capture tool. And then the regional mitigation funds would essentially allow cities and towns to levy and pool mitigation payments from multiple developments over time, and ideally to make uh, larger scale investments. Um, this one in particular and regional ballot initiatives are, are things that I I'm already starting to hear that you know, Congress hopes that states and counties have these mechanisms in place so that when they're giving federal dollars, there's an ability to kind of make some sort of local match. So again, these are mechanisms that we would really wanna see put in place so that we can actually really leverage financial um, federal dollars. 
Um, and the, the last one that had been previously included in our transportation revenue document is around TNC fees. Again, we've been working on this for years. It's past due to raise our local TNC fees. Um, and then the last one in the local category is around uh, the real estate transfer fees. And again, we took a position in support of this at the end of last legislative session and um, actually helped some of those, some municipalities who'd filed home rules um, on this, allowing them to do that at the very local level to actually see those pass inside the legislature. Um, and again, we would, we would essentially request as a local option to implement um, a transfer fee of no more than 2% and then kind of create the opportunity for municipalities to create appro appropriate carve outs. So I think that's the document. You can stop screen sharing, Diego. And you need to take a breath. <laughs> and I'd be, I would welcome your questions and thoughts on this document. I see Sam. Go ahead. I'll, I'll open. I'm sure people, other people whoever. have questions. Okay. <laughs> um, question, Lizzie. What, uh, two questions. One is uh, more general, which is what is your overall time frame for this? It, it looks like these are funding sources deep into the future. What, what are you hoping for? I mean, you know, I honestly think, Sam, that it's an important it's important for us to start having this conversation about how we raise revenue for the longer term and to have that conversation with the legislature now-ish. Um, I don't think it's necessarily realistic that, that the legislature will, will pass, especially big taxation mechanisms right now, particularly when we are about to see so much money coming from the federal government. But I do feel like as the session continues, you remember it is a two-year time frame that so, you know, we're already going to start to see how that money is dwindling. Um, and again, a lot of these revenue raising mechanisms are things that MAPC has been weighing in on for a long, long time. Um, and so kind of continuing that conversation about long-term stable transportation funding, that, that they won't be surprised, that won't be new um, for the legislature to hear that from us. But I think some of the larger ones, I think it's gonna be a much harder conversation inside the state house. And so I expect that that conversation will continue through the, the two-year timeframe of the legislative session, if not into the out years. And then my other question is related more specifically to the gas tax. It, it seems like gas is a declining resource in every sense and eventually will be replaced by other forms of fuel for transit and transportation. Um, does it make sense to try to get more blood out of that stone or just to re try to rethink the bigger picture? And um, I think, you know, sort of my, my personal and professional opinion on this sort of converge, I think it is safe to say you're right, the gas tax is a declining revenue source, but most of us are going to own internal combustion engine cars. They're going to be on the road for at least the next, you know, 15, 20 years, um, unless we, you know, totally shift the way we, we move towards EVs. But I don't think it's um, necessarily moving that fast, and that's particularly true in, in um, rural populations in particular. Um, and so I think that it, the gas tax is still a useful tool. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're kind of overdue in raising, but I do think it's important at the same time to actually be also trying to push some of these other revenue raising mechanisms for transportation, because there will be a moment where the gas tax has declined sufficiently that we haven't actually figured out a way to replace it. Thanks. Those were my questions. Others. Great. <laughs> you managed to you managed to stun them all. With <laughs> Never. Oh, oh, I see. I see Jenny's hand up. Jenny, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll give you a question um, if you want one desperately. <laughs> um, well, first I want to say I I think this is great. It's very obviously there's a lot in here, a lot to work with. Um, I think I've asked this question before for something different, but I I think it's helpful to understand the agency's priorities and where you'll sort of put staff energy to pursue any of these items and then what kind of support you need from the broader MAPC, you know, beyond the executive committee, but how that would actually work. Um, so that's two, that's kind of a two-part thing. Not, it's more of a comment too, not necessarily a question. Um, and then I think the point about sort of what is the real impact of the COVID relief funding that we're going to receive and whether or not that actually is beyond FY 
now, this current fiscal year and beyond, I think is something that I have questions about still, and I remain slightly unclear about how that's going to all come into play and what how that interacts with the things that you're proposing here. Yeah. Um, so it's th th these are kind of comments, not exactly questions, but if you want to respond, that's okay as well. I'm happy to. Um, I, I'm actually gonna take them in reverse order and kind of talk about the federal piece first. Um, you know, I do, so the money that's coming in from ARPA does actually come into in two tranches. So some of it is for this fiscal year and some is for next fiscal year. But I think, you know, the thing that's important to remember about the ARPA money is that it is, that is meant to be relief dollars. Those are not actually that longer term recovery dollars. Um, and even at the same time, which the, the which Congress hasn't actually started moving on yet, what we expect to see like an infrastructure bill and what that actually includes, because the universe of what's in an infrastructure bill, I think, is getting larger, rightfully. Um, but I also think, you know, we are working, we, we have a number of summaries, I feel like every day since ARPA passed, Diego, I get like another summary coming in from somebody about what's included in it and what the money is to be used for. I think there are still a number of questions about exactly what that picture looks like. Um, and we are actually working on kind of um, putting together sort of a usable summary on our own um, and also talking with folks in the administration about how the money should be used. Um, that the state gets directly and then talking with the legislature about how they might want to put some parameters, I think Mark mentioned this, around the money that's coming in from, from the federal, federal government because I think it's really important and the legislature will absolutely want to touch that and kind of put their imprimatur on how that those dollars should be used and, and obviously we have a lot of thoughts on that. I expect that Mark and Rebecca have other thoughts on what I have just said around the federal money. So I'm just going to pause there for a second and then I can get back to the first part of your question. Rebecca, do you want to add anything here? Yeah, I think, you know, and beyond the kind of near term pieces, I think one of the major conversations that we're going to be having as an agency and hoping having with our municipalities is kind of how can we come together regionally and, and really think about the best use for this funding and make sure that we're really targeting targeting it maybe towards you know, some investments and things that will actually help with longer term recovery and relief. And so I imagine that that is going to be a tremendous amount of work that we're doing over the next year. And you know, really, we've been very successful in getting folks out of their municipal silos to think about this current moment of kind of response. But I think it's going to be harder and more work to think about how do we get out of our municipal silos when we think about relief and recovery. And I, I really think that is something that the people around this table in their kind of respective roles in their community could really be advocates for. And, and hopefully we can set regional tables, you know, through the subregions or, or through the you know, mayoral councils to try to raise that conversation up so that we are, as a commonwealth, kind of using these dollars the best that we can. Um, I will add to that just a little bit about uh, equity in the future of our uh, fiscal picture in Massachusetts and nationally. Uh, you know, there are a lot of folks who are saying, well, the recovery needs to be equitable and it needs to encourage greater equity in our society. And also it needs to encourage resiliency. And resiliency has a, a relatively narrow meaning in terms of climate, but it also has a broader meaning in terms of a wide variety of, of, um, of social aspects of our society. And I think one of the important messages that we are going to have to transmit and that many other people are going to have to transmit is that there's no way to get to equity if we can't make more funding available for critical public uses. Um, a lot of the inequity on in our society is as a result of government action and it, it actually takes government spending in order to redress at least some of it. We could very easily, even with the um, kind of one-time expenditures and fairly generous, but nonetheless one-time expenditures from the federal relief bill could easily slip into a situation where, you know, we can't fund the Promise Act fully. So we kind of go halfway and we still have a sucky transit system that doesn't have enough investments in either improvement or electrification or expansion, and uh, municipalities are hand to mouth without any decent tools of their own to raise additional revenue. It honestly, it'd be very easy to slip into that situation because then the new normal is kind of like the old normal. And 
I would say that you know, additional revenue to address some of these issues is not sufficient to resolving these problems, but it is actually necessary. And, um, and I think getting people to understand that larger picture and then to say there are a whole bunch of ways we could do it and we don't have to do them all, but we do actually have to pick some of them is a fairly critical uh, objective for us to follow or else kind of all of this talk about a more equitable and resilient future is gonna be just that, it'll be talk. Um, so on the other part of your question, Jenny, around sort of how we prioritize, how, how we kind of invest our time. And I think it's not unrelated to Sam's question um, about sort of like the time frame for when these things are moving. Um, you know, there have been a number of transportation conversations that have continued in the state house this session, including um, and particularly on the Senate side. You know, so I think that there will be opportunities to actually continue to talk about transportation revenue in particular. Um, I do think some of those larger, the conversations about the larger statewide revenue um, conversations, we would be looking to work with other groups and we reference the work that the Mass Budget and Policy Center has done on these issues and kind of think with them through how we, you know, assuming we would get approval that we would think through with them about how we might be helpful in elevating those conversations. And then I think some of that'll be about working um, with our cities and towns that are kind of particularly ready to try to move on some of those taxation mechanisms or would like to see that to actually elevate their voice inside the those coalition conversations. Um, and also to give those local examples, some of which Mark was just alluding to, because I do feel like particularly inside the state house that that texture is really important for legislators. Thank you. I won't. I won't. Can I won't go on. But I, I appreciate all of the elaboration and follow up on that. And I agree with the points about you know we don't want a new subpar normal reality. So totally on board with that. Yeah, we really don't. Great. Any other um, questions or comments? So um, Keith and or Lizzie, what are you all looking for today? Well, I'd, I'd uh, say that the Legislative Committee uh, made a, uh, a unanimous recommendation uh, along uh, the lines that I'll recite. So uh, I would move that the Executive Committee adopt uh, the uh, favorable recommendation of the Executive a committee for funding options to advance an equitable recovery as uh, set forth by staff. Second. Okay, motion made by Keith, second made by Mo, and that's the favorable recommendation of the legislative committee, correct? Yes. Okay. And Mo, that's okay with you? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, is there any questions or comments before we go to the roll call vote, which is required? Not seeing any, but there's a lot of you. So just speak up if I miss you. No? Okay, great. Uh, please unmute so we can make this expeditious. Um, Sharonda? Aye. John Barrows? Keith? Aye. Karen? Adam? Aye. Bob? Mayor Curtitone? Tom Daniel? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Sandra? Aye. Mo? Aye. Jared? Tabor? Yes. Steve? Aye. Caitlin? George? Courtney? Jenny? Yes. Vandana? Abstain. Sam? Yes. Steve? Lauren? Mayor Spicer? Yes. Juan? Elaine? Abstain. Abstain, Elaine. And Aaron, uh, aye. Aaron? So the, yeah. Aaron? Oh. I, I was on a phone call, so that's why I couldn't chime in on it. I, I have to abstain because I couldn't take part in this, this, this debate. Okay. That's totally fine. So the motion, thank you, Bob. So the motion passes with three abstentions, Bob, Vandana, and Elaine for Heidi's purposes. Thank you so much uh, to the legislative committee and 
the legislative staff. Um, that was really great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Um, next up on the agenda is the approval of the nominating committee. I feel like we were just here. Oh, wait, that was a year ago. So, uh, Rebecca, uh, take it away. Yes, and I, I, I want to thank all of those executive committee members that are willing to serve. Uh, so we're looking for a vote of the executive committee to approve the nominating committee. I'll remind her that's the group of executive committee members that get together yearly to nominate the slate of officers. I'm very happy to report that all of our officers are uh, rerunning for their positions. Um, so right now, the folks that I am looking for approval of are uh, Tom Daniel, Sharonda Almeida, Jenny Raitt, Elaine Vanya, and Tabor Keeley. Make the motion to approve. Second. Okay. Motion made by John DePriest with the second made by Mo. Any questions, comments? Not seeing any, great. Please unmute, roll call again is required. Where is my sheet? Here we go. Sharonda. Aye. John, Keith. Or I, I vote, I wanna say thank you to all of the officers for making themselves available for another year. Aye. Uh, thanks, uh, Karen. Adam. Aye. Bob. Yes. Mayor Curtitone. Tom. Aye. Aye. John. Aye. Yep. Aye. John. Okay. Yolanda. Sandra. Yes. Mo. Yes. Jared. Tabor. Yes. Steve. Yes. Caitlin. George. Courtney. Jenny. Yes. Bandana. Yes. Sam. Yes. Steve. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Yes. Juan. Elaine. Yeah. <laughs> and Erin, aye. Motion passes unanimously. I want to thank uh, Rebecca for kind of coordinating this. I know it's more of a pain as we do it remotely. So I appreciate your time on this. And I also want to thank the uh, five executive committee members who have offered uh, to serve on the nominating committee. It's great. And what a great experience, right? Sure. Okay. All right, next up on the agenda is business not known at the time of the posting. Um, Mark, is there anything? All right, good. Ha Rebecca, you're good? Perfect. I just want to oh, in my sorry. update, I did forget to mention um, that we are also doing a lot of work coordinating uh, communications and communication strategies around how to have potentially help uh, vaccine hesitant populations think about vaccine access. Um, as well as really thinking about ambassador programs, so partnership with community-based organizations to go out and reach people where they are. And we have a webinar coming up on that on Tuesday, um, which Barry Keppard is leading. So I would just encourage everyone, if they're interested uh, to attend, I think it's gonna be really interesting and it's just another way that we are uh, working on COVID response. Awesome. What a great way to kind of finish. Um, and I want to, I'm going to get that motion in one minute. Um, I want to thank you all for taking time. I know we kind of rush at the end to uh, move and vote. So I really do appreciate you taking time uh, this month for the meeting. And uh, if you are so inclined, since we did talk about elections uh, coming up quickly, um, Heidi will be sending out that information shortly. Uh, about running again. You'll get a letter from Mark and I on it. Very exciting stuff. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, serving this year. And if you're in so inclined and have time to do so, I encourage you to run again if you wish. Uh, and with that being said, I would love to entertain a motion um, to adjourn. So move. move. All right, I'm gonna say Mo motion that time and Bob seconded this time, just to mix it up a little bit for the minutes. <laughs> Um, does, <laughs> our, uh, that sounds great. Let's let's do a roll call and then uh, we will all feast and enjoy the 16 extra minutes we have for this hour. Okay, here we go. Sharonda? Aye. John? Aye. Keith? Aye. Karen? Adam? Bob? Yes. Mayor Curtitone? Tom? Yes. John? Yes. Yolanda? Sandra? Yes. Mo? Yes. Jared? Tabor? Yes. Steve? Yes. Caitlin? 
George, Courtney, Jenny. Yes. Fandana. Yes. Sam. Yes. Steve. Lauren. Mayor Spicer. Yes. Juan. Elaine. Aaron. Yes. Uh, thank you all. Motion passes. Meeting is adjourned at 1245. I hope you all have a great day and a great uh, rest of the week. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.